Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your uh, obedience, everyone who prayed tonight, Sister Brooks, Dr. Pam, Sister Veronica, for um, uh, listening to the Holy Spirit. This is the way that prayer meetings should be. Uh, it should be heavy in prayer. Uh, and so uh, I'm so grateful that, uh, that uh, all of you were uh, obedient tonight. Uh, I have, uh, as usual, I want to remind you, I don't record the prayer requests or the prayer. We kind of start right after that. And, uh, and then we go forward and I'm going to try to, to be uh, a little more disciplined tonight. I, I would like more people to come on. And I understand that some people won't come if they think we're going to be on all night uh, <laughs> on Wednesday night, which, hey, to be honest with you, it's, it's good with me. Uh, I mean, it's all voluntary. Nobody's held hostage when you have to go. You just have to go. I won't hold it against you. But if those who are into the conversation would like to continue, uh, we can do that as well. Please share these things with others. Uh, we had somebody once again tonight that had no idea that we were doing this for prayer meeting. So, so please share, even with your fellow church members, what we are doing. Uh, so we are in the book, Preparation for the Final Crisis. And I know it might seem a little silly. I keep putting this disclaimer up every week. And uh, in reference to, I don't believe that COVID-19 is the mark of the beast, nor is I do I believe that the vaccine is the mark of the beast. I keep saying it. Uh, because I know how we can be. Uh, we, we can, we can uh, turn every news item or world issue into a prophecy issue. Uh, and uh, some things are, but uh, sicknesses, diseases, illnesses, they shift, they come, we battle it. Praise the Lord, some we figured out how to overcome and others we have not. And, uh, and I just wanna be a little bit more reserved on that and inflaming that because, um, you know, I'm quite sure that, uh, that previous viruses that have shown up in humanity, uh, I remember we talked about polio one time and uh, uh, things of that nature uh, were, were all deadly and uh, and humanity figured it out. And so, uh, but what I'm concerned about, I know that some things in the news are reflective of what Satan is doing, but personally, I'm more concerned about your soul, about your relationship with God, because mm -hmm. if you get that right, then it does not matter what else happens. And so that's why we take the time we are almost at the end of this book, but that's why we take the time to include studies uh, in just about everything that we do, because God commands us to, to study, to show ourselves approved. And so, uh, so we're going to uh, begin uh, uh, the study portion. We're in this chapter nine, it's called the time of trouble, and it should be a good discussion tonight and I just ask that we be, be orderly. Uh, we're inviting everyone to, to participate, uh, but uh, be courteous to your neighbor. We're not looking for anybody to dominate the conversation, but to contribute to the conversation. So that's what we're doing tonight. And uh, let me just pray once again uh, for the lesson, and then we're gonna get into our discussion tonight. Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, you ask us to cherish it and hold it in high esteem because it's you communicating with us. You, you want to uh, lighten our loads. You want us to know. You want us to be wise, to understand. And uh, so, Lord, we pray that uh, you impart that to us, that uh, your Holy Spirit give us the wisdom, the harmony, and the understanding to accomplish your work. You gave us three angels' messages, 
you told us uh, that time is short. And so, Lord, uh, help us to respond in kind is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So let's get to it tonight. We had the close of probation part one on last week. Part two is a little bit shorter, uh, trying, to, trying to manage the time a little better. And so we're going to get right into it. Uh, tonight, uh, we're dealing with the four angels holding back the four winds of strife. And I, I, and, and I want to say this because it's very important. No one was expecting everybody to be an expert on all of this. Uh, there's nothing wrong with asking questions uh, in reference to the material, as long as we're on the subject. There's nothing wrong with asking questions and talking it through and getting clarification uh, in your mind as to what these things mean and where we are. Uh, and so, so uh, want to just make sure you have you know you have permission to to seek understanding so i'm starting on page 130 paragraph two it says transgression has almost reached its limit confusion fills the world and a great terror is come is to come upon human beings the end is very near now i thought about this when sister veronica was praying because i too heard and I don't really watch TV like that, but I did hear about the 15 year old girl killed in Walmart. And I thought about this particular paragraph in our study. Transgression has almost reached its limit. And what I find interesting is so many Christians um, want to argue that to see it this way is being extreme. When as a Christian, we should be bothered by sin, period. First by our own sin and then sin in the world. One of the most powerful prayers to pray, and I included in my prayer life and I have for a long time, is Lord, help me to love what you love and help me to hate what you hate. Yes, Lord. There should never be a Christian trying to minimize sin. No, that's the thing that we're supposed to call out. You call it out in prayer in our own life. And then we, call, we point it out in the world because we're telling people, don't go that way, go the other way. All right? So, so I just find it interesting. And it's not a shot at anybody, but it's, it always seems to be that way where Christians are saying, oh, it ain't that bad. You know, there's always been these things and there'll always be and blah, 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 blah. But well, I thought we were preparing for the coming of Christ. So let's deal with these four angels. And again, we're going to have a great discussion in just a second. We got to do a little reading first. Okay, here's Revelation 7.1. It says, and after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. Anybody want to elaborate on what they think this means? If not, we're just going to keep on, we're going to go on to... I'll make, a, I'll make a comment. I think that God has a... The Bible says God has a controversy with the nations. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about sin a few minutes ago. I think sin is very, very offensive to God because it caused the death of his son. And because God is angry and does have a controversy with the nations and he will punish the nations that in his love and mercy he has angels holding back the winds because winds because the winds represent more turmoil on the nations and i think we see this every day 
on the news when there's earthquakes and volcanoes. But God does not destroy the earth because he's not willing that any should be lost. So that's what I think. The four winds shows God's mercy with us. Oh, thank, you. thank you, Sister Whitlock. Uh, anyone else want to follow her on that? All right, so let's let's move on. See, I'm, I'm trying to behave tonight and not comment on every little thing, but we're going to get to it. Chapter 9, page 130, paragraph 4 says, John sees the elements of nature, earthquake, tempest, and political strife, represented as being held by four angels. These ones are under control until God gives the word to let them go. Now, now that you've heard a little more insight on it, would you like to comment on it now? Does this bring you comfort? How does this make you feel to hear that? Afraid. Afraid? Okay, would you like to elaborate on that? Yes. Okay. Oh, you want me to laugh? Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm asking yeah, so I, I, about you feeling afraid. Go ahead. Well, I think that God is holding back a lot of strife, a lot of things that could completely implode the world. Uh, like the other person said that he's showing mercy on mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Because if, if he let those four winds go, it will be a calamity that even though we think we're going through something now, we aren't because he's holding those things back. Even though we think that we're having political strife now, we haven't seen anything of what it could be including, as another person said, nature, earthquakes, thunder, lightning, tsunamis, all those things. He's not, we're not feeling the full force of what we could feel because God is holding those things back through the agency of the angels. So I don't feel afraid. I feel more confident because... He's not allowing all those things to happen to us at once. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. I, I am with you on that, Dr. Pam. Uh, Elder Hood uh, has her hand raised. Go right ahead. I uh, disagree with what was um, said uh, prior to. And, uh, yeah, there, there's, um, there is a comfort in knowing that um, he is holding back uh, those calamities, how things could be um, if the enemy was allowed to just have his way in that, you know, we're told to redeem the time. So I see that God is saying, hey, I'm giving you time to make your call and election sure, because there is coming uh, these calamities upon the earth but I'm going to stay the hand of the enemy long enough for as many of my people um, to, to be sealed. And so I see it as mercy and grace that he's extending to each of us to, you know, work out our salvation, you know, put away the things that will cause us to miss out on the kingdom and not be able to stand in the last days when these things come upon the land, because by that time, you know, what uh, was read a couple weeks ago in prayer meeting, who's, whoever's just remain unjust, you know, so even though we may still be living, you know, by that time, those who are sealed are sealed. So I see him in, as a merciful God saying that I'm giving you time to work out your salvation. Amen. Amen. That is that is absolutely uh, correct. 
uh, uh, both of you. Uh, I want to bring your attention to a scripture at the beginning of Earth's history. I want you to think about how much time has passed since this text. This is Genesis 6, verse 5. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's the beginning of scripture. That's Genesis 6 and, and, and verse 5. Imagine how this has compounded exponentially since then. Right now, um, there are several countries who would love to have an all-out war with this country. And some of them for good reason. <laughs> you know, and, and, and those countries have some of the nuclear capabilities that our country has. All it takes is for Satan to be the major influence on one person and it can start. I don't know if anybody remember the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I'm using you know something everybody can understand. There's other ways that calamity can come. If if it were not for the grace of God, what do you think men would do? Everything that can be weaponized has been weaponized. Even little subtle things. When I was uh, with Fifth Special Forces Group, that whole thing in Somalia. You, you know, some of you may have heard of that movie, Black Hawk Down. I was serving during that time. That whole thing was about thugs weaponizing water, denying water to people who need it. Just imagine how evil someone has to be to use water as leverage to put people in slavery. But that's what was happening. And you're talking about early 90s when this took place. There's no telling what's going on in the world today. So yes, though there are terrible things that happen in the world, though there are things that, that make us scratch our head and say, well, why in the world did that happen? Understand that this scripture is true. God is holding the enemy back from all that he would want to do. So let's go just a little bit further and we're going to get some more people to comment. Here's paragraph four on page 130 of preparation for the final crisis. There is safety, there is, there is the safety of God's church. The angels of God do his bidding, holding back the winds of the earth that the wind should blow on the earth nor on the trees. But as long as Jesus remains man's intercessor, amen, in the sanctuary above, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is felt by rulers and people. Now, I want to pause right there. Angels holding back the four winds of strife is symbolism. Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary as our intercessor is literal. It is the position and the service, the function of Jesus right now uh, that is uh, holding back all that would be done if the devil could do it. And I like this part, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is felt by rulers and people. Amen. Understand how powerful that is? No matter yes. how wicked men want to be, there is a governor on them. There, there's a spirit of truth. That's why I like using the example of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, God sent him a Daniel, you know, and, and all the other Hebrew worthies. Even though Nebuchadnezzar wasn't asking for it, he wasn't praying for it, but God always positions his spirit, his spirit to influence even the most wicked of men. Any thoughts on what we've read so far? I um, was thinking about uh, the holding back of, of the winds, and you mentioned Genesis 6. Yes. In a way, that was a mini holding back for 120 years. Mm -hmm. God held back disaster from this this world mm -hmm. 
giving Noah a, a chance to try to help people get ready. And he had to let it go because they wouldn't get ready. Then if you move a little further and you look uh, you look at the history of the Jews again and again and again, if you read all the way through their history to Malachi, God was kept holding back and holding back. If If you'll do this, then I, I will take care of you. And he kept holding back, holding back, holding back, till finally he had to uh, scatter the Jews because they just what, would not listen. And now it's come to the big, I guess you could say the big um, uh, thing that's going to happen, and that he's holding back the winds again. And it, People are not listening. Mm -hmm. People are not taking it seriously. Uh, I listen to sometimes to Moody, and they're talking about the tribulation, and they're talking about the rapture, and this, that, and the other. And sometimes I want to call them up and say, folk, you all don't get it. Mm -hmm. You don't get it. There's more to it than, than, than what you're talking about. The world isn't going uphill. It's going downhill. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Good point. Excellent comment. Excellent. All right. Any anyone else? Yes. Just just to go back um, to the to the to the win, and why I think it's important for individuals who feel as though there's no hope for them. You know, um, just the love the love that he has for us in that he doesn't owe us anything. Mm. Um, I mean, absolutely nothing. He gave all that he needed to give and then some, and he continues to give. So, you know, um, people have done things that, that, you know, you feel bad. Some people really do regret some of the choices that they've made in their lives and they feel as though, you know, there is no hope It's too late. And God is saying, you know, I'm, I'm holding this back for you. There is time. There is hope. You can. And so I see encouragement for, um, for us who feel as though, man, can I really do it? And he says, yes, and I'm going to help you to overcome by way of not allowing some of the things that could potentially rob you completely of any hope of ever, you know, having the opportunity to experience um, his goodness and, and meet him in peace. And so, yeah, I, I see uh, encouragement for those who feel as though you know it's too late for me. I've messed up or whatever, or or you know so forth and so on. Thanks. Wow, wow, that is very insightful, and uh, I believe sometimes um, we can all be guilty of. Like I used the Nebuchadnezzar Daniel illustration, we can look at those events and see ourselves as Daniel, but sometimes we're Nebuchadnezzar. Right, and we're not always the hero in the story. Sometimes we're the one that needs to repent and turn from our wicked ways and be redeemed. And God comes even when you don't call Him. Very powerful. Yes, that's Anybody else who's trying to come in? Yes. Um, this statement reminds me. Uh, the the scripture is Proverbs twenty one one. Mm -hmm. It says, "The king's heart is like a stream of water." directed by the Lord, he guides it wherever he pleases. So when you mention about King Nebuchadnezzar and that God is yet in control of everything, mm -hmm. and so people, uh, men who are in positions of power think that they're really running something. But God is yet in control. You will do his bidding. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? The issue also is, is that everybody else is wicked. <laughs> and we <laughs> will bear the brunt of the wickedness of each other. Even mm. if we thought we were good or tried to do good. Or what about your neighbor? Mm -hmm. Your friends, your family. Mm -hmm. So it's a what I would call a catch-22. 
Great point. Amen. 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 You know, I like to say, um, the Bible says that the, in any way, the Lord takes care of the righteous. As wicked as the world was back in the antediluvian world, God found grace in one man. And because of one man, he saved his family and the world is still here. That's why we're here. And if you think about Lot, think about every time when God got angry with the Israelites because of what they were doing, anytime they would turn. And I think we should not be worried so much about what other people are doing. I think the angels are holding the four winds because he wants to seal more of us. He wants us to be saved. And we talk about how terrible people are, but the Bible talks about uh, a number that no man can number, that's covered in white robes. A lot of people will be saved. I think we just need to stay close to Christ, do, you know, and, and, and have faith that he will save us. We should... We should not be in doom and gloom. I believe the eyes of the Lord is over the whole earth, be over all the leaders. And Pastor, like you said, other countries have nuclear weapons, but so far they've had, ever since the atomic bomb, okay? They've had the ability to destroy the earth, but God hasn't let them. And it's going to end exactly like it says in the book of Revelation. I'll leave it alone. <laughs> and I know you're coming back, Sister Whitlock. You can't leave it alone. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, the message in scripture is to the church. Let's not forget that. That's why I said that we often kind of romanticize stories and we see ourselves as Daniel. But sometimes we're Nebuchadnezzar. God is trying to get us to examine ourselves, to change some things, to be more committed to him, to put our trust in him. It, it, for those of you who can see the screen, the statement begins, as long as Jesus remains man's intercessor. That's the restraining influence is Jesus. He is, he is the buffer between what we deserve and what God wants us to have. Uh, any, anyone else want to make a comment before we move on? All right. Well, wait a minute. I need to finish that, that thought there on this page. In reference to the Holy Spirit, the statement says, it still controls to some extent the laws of the land. Well, man, you know, as you were saying, Sister Whitlock, sometimes it looks like there is no righteousness whatsoever. But the Bible is telling us uh, in reference to these four winds that God still is actively involved. Were it not for these laws, the conditions of the world would be much worse than it is now. And I think that's what everybody's been saying. So we're gonna go on now because we're almost done for tonight. Uh, page 31, paragraph two says, the apostle John in vision heard a loud voice in heaven exclaiming, Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Revelation 12, 12. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, I mean, because I mean, this is just a pastor's heart right here. How in the world because there's another the text where people cry, peace, peace, but destruction is going to follow that, right? How in the world does the devil have more faith in the scripture than the church? If, if this Revelation 12, 12 says the devil is in a hurry because he knows, not he thinks, he hopes, he supposes, he knows that he only has a short time, so he is focused on what it is he's out to do because he's read the scripture and he knows 
you know, it, it's interesting um, that uh, when I'm trying to curtail something or, or bring balance, bring something back to the middle or get people to follow procedure, the first thing that members say to me is, well, pastor, pastor, you got to let them get away with it because they're faithful. And here's, this is, will always be my response. Being faithful does not mean we're doing things right. The devil is faithful. He's faithful to his vision, but God does not approve of the devil's faith. Now, I know that went over somebody's head, but it is true. Being That's faithful right. is good, but we got to be faithful to God's process. God is just as concerned with how as he is to what. It's, it's, it's the nation of Islam that says by any means necessary, not God. God cares about how we get to where we're going. Huh. As a matter of fact, I can show you times in the scripture where people got the outcome they wanted, but God disapproved because of okay. how they went about doing it. So how does matter? So I'm back to my original question. The devil read the scripture and believed it. Why don't we? I think the devil believes it because he knows God better than some of us. He <laughs> lived in heaven with him. He's been thrown out. He mm -hmm. tried to destroy the world. He tried to destroy Christ when he was born. He tried to kill Moses. And he's aware that don't care what he does, God is stronger than him. He has. He tried when Christ was on earth to get him to sin, he couldn't. And when Jesus died on the cross and went back to heaven, he knew it was over. He yeah. believes God. I think his faith in God is stronger than ours because we get scared when we see things. <laughs> Satan is scared of one thing, and that is that his end is on his way, that God is going to crush his head and burn him up for good. Now I'll let you yeah. <laughs> they said exactly what I was going to say. Satan, Satan had face-to-face -face dealings with God that we should have and could have if we would. Mm -hmm. And then maybe our faith would be strong as his if we would try to have face-to-face -face dealings with God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The study tonight is about time. Do we have plenty of time or do we have a short time, right? And so that my comments is in that context in reference to Satan's faith. I'm not saying Satan is good. I'm saying that God says it's over and Satan believes it. Since Whitlock just preached it, we could say the benediction right now because she, was, <laughs> I heard a little Baptist twang in her voice a minute ago. She was getting down. I should have bet her when she said she was done with it. I know she's coming back. But, uh, but anybody else want to uh, to make a comment about Revelation 12.12? 12? Mm. <laughs> all right. Um, Sister Betty said it all, Pastor. She said it all. Didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go on to Great Controversy, page 623. Fearful are the scenes which call forth the exclamation from the heavenly, from the heavenly, from the heavenly voice. Uh, that's a typo. The wrath of Satan increases as his time grows short and his work of deceit and destruction will reach its culmination in the time of trouble. All right, other than that little typo right there, Did everybody understand what's happening here? What's being said in Great Controversy 623? The shorter the time, the harder Satan works to yeah. for for to create mayhem, destruction, and ultimately for us to be lost. And this takes place in the time of trouble. Right? Any thoughts or questions on that? Everybody on the same page? Yes, oh, yes. You said uh, in our own work as human beings, sometimes when we know that we're at the uh, close, we're at the, our closing or it's the, the last couple of minutes of our exam, we're trying to rush through and 
uh, you're, you're no longer being cautious and weighing out the consequences and trying to examine if that's uh, phrased and worded just right. You throw all of that to the wind and you're working with haste and, and trying to just get it in, get it all in, get it done. And that's what we see Satan doing. He is working full speed ahead, uh, no, just hurrying up and not, to not caring about any damages, what they call collateral damage. Just get it done. Just take out as many people by any means necessary, by every means, by every means. Um, he doesn't care if you fall in the ditch on the right or on the left. If you're too religious or you're not religious enough, he doesn't care as long as he's got you off the path and your eyes off of Christ. He doesn't care. Wow. Amen. 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 Can't Amen. argue with that. All right. Any well, any But I heard somebody else trying to get in. I don't want to rush past you. We're, uh, I think we're heading to the finish line here. So here's the issue. Who knows how much time we have? Oh Do we God. want to gamble with the time? I mean, even if, we, you know, we're not just talking about the second coming of Christ, but we don't have, know how much time we have in our lives. Uh, right. Somebody mentioned earlier, a young girl probation closed for her at 15. Mm. The girl in Walmart, probation has closed for her. You see. So do we really want to play with this? No. No. So, you know, I, I just have, and, and you, you probably figured it out now. It's, believe it or not, it's been almost a year, one more month, and it'll be a year that I've been with you. And uh, there are several things that, that are repetitive with me, and you probably figured out some of it. But one of them is, I have a concern about who we put our hope in. Right. We, we, yes, we ought to fight the good fight. We ought to call evil by his name. We ought to make an impact on the world, be salt and light. Uh, you know, uh, we ought to be warriors for Christ in all areas of life, but where we put our hope, it's in the heavenly sanctuary right now. That's who we should trust. You know, remember when the Lord asked Peter, do you love me? Finally, he said, Lord, only, you know, because Peter realized I can't even trust me. <laughs> I, I can only trust you. Any, any thoughts on that? Um, Pastor, I just want a, a quick thought on the time, you know. That's that's a lie that Satan has on um, us. Because there's a lot of people that walk away from the church. And, you know, you're witness to them and telling them to come back, you know, and, in, you know, encouraging them to come back to, you know, to your faith and stuff like that. But Satan let them have this idea that they have enough time. You know, a lot of people say, I have to do this first. I have to do that first, you know, and all these excuses. But the time is now. The time is now because tomorrow is not promised to us. And that's what he uses. He uses the, the time like, oh, no, you have time to do this. You have time to do that. But I'm just saying that. You know, we have to take inventory of our life and the time that we spend. What are we spending it doing, you know? What is the things that we out there spending our time doing? God forbid, you know, something happened to us and we, we don't get it right, you know? That's it. Probation closes for us. So that's just a lie that um, Satan tells us that we have time. He knows that his time is short, but he wants us to think that we have time, you know? And... Um, Beautiful, beautiful. That's why the hymns are so important to me. I love all kinds of gospel music, and I like to bob my head and tap my feet. I might even shout for a minute. My rhythm can only hold it about 15 seconds, then I'm off. But the, the hymns are eternal because the gospel is in them. You know, when I hear people talking, I was listening to Sister Veronica. I heard the hymn, The Things of This World Grow Strangely Dim. 
you know, they, they have power in them. And if your technology fails, what you, what's hidden in your heart still works, you see? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the whole world just goes to shambles. Now, this picture I have on the screen, and I apologize for people who can't see, it's, it's special because not only is there a map of the world behind it, the device piece, the time piece also has navigation, you know? You, you, you can focus, you know, it's all these questions about should we do this, should we do that, should we go here, should we participate in that? All of those questions go away when you know where you're going. See, all these, you know, feelings of missing out only occur when you're not sure where you want to go. But when you know you want to go to heaven, then the, the questions and answers take care of themselves. Anything that gets in the way or even just delays. Remember the prophet that's unnamed in scripture? God told him he went and did what God told him to do. He preached the word and God says, on the way home, do not stop, come straight home. And what does he do? He runs into another prophet and he stopped. And therefore, right at the end, right before the close of his assignment, he's lost. You gotta know where you're going and, uh, and so I believe the spirit of the Lord is moving on all of us. We just need to answer him. We need to stop fighting him. Where we're going is far better than where we are. And we all need to settle that in our hearts, that where God is calling us is worth anything that we're going to miss out on down here. But listen to Matthew 24, 31. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. I want you to imagine that in your mind, that when Jesus stands up and he steps out, remember that song, The Midnight Cry? When he steps out of the priestly robe and put on his war robe and, and, uh, and that savior connotation, that description of God, uh, now adds the Michael uh, part to it, component to it, where he's now a man of war and he's going to come and get his children and there is nothing that the enemy can do about it. Jesus is coming to get you and to get me and he's not gonna do it secretly. No, Matthew 24, 31 says he's gonna do it loud. He's going to do it boldly. You know why? For 6,000 years, the devil been lying loud. He's been tricking people loud. He's been acting the fool loud. The devil been doing that all this time loud. This has allowed nature to take its course. But now when he comes, he's going to send his angels to come and gather all the saints together. And I want to know, how will you feel when you hear the trumpet? That all depends on where you want to go. Mm -hmm. If you've sown seeds of a life without God, then that trumpet is a horrible sound. If you put your trust in men, that trumpet is a terrible sound. If, if, if you've given in to your lower nature and you, you care about more about the tangible things of this world than our heavenly home, that trumpet is a frightful sound. But if you've worn this world like a loose garment and you put your hope in Jesus and you made sure that you've confessed and that you made amends and that you've laid on your face and said, God, help me, then that trumpet is a relieving sound. Because people who are fighting the good fight of faith, they'll be relieved when they hear that trumpet. That means that now I can lay down my weapons down by the riverside and study war no more. Listen, listen to this. Listen to this because I'm closing it out now. Psalm 61 and verse 2. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me. Huh. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. There will be no arrogant people going to glory. There will be no know-it-alls going to glory. There will be no yeah but people going to glory. Everybody going to heaven with Jesus are humble people who realize they are limited. And God says, 
You don't need to know everything. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Faith is trusting me even when you can't see it all. So here it is. From one end of the earth, the people of God will cry unto the Lord when their hearts are overwhelmed and he will build a shelter for us. Psalm 61 and verse 2. And boy, I wish everybody could see this last slide. I know some of you can. I'll try to describe it. It is Jesus in the middle and every kind of soldier you could think of bowing the knee to Jesus. Mm. Every soldier from the Crusaders mm. to the Romans to, to the current uh, mighty American fighting force to uh, Arabs to Asians, they're all bowing at the feet of Jesus. You know, there's much been said about America doesn't have a budget for the military, that it is unlimited. Well, there's a little truth to that, but it doesn't matter what men come up with. It doesn't matter what inventions we have to destroy. It cannot overcome God's capacity to heal. Yeah, so, God yeah, doesn't thanks. need any satellites in the sky. Oh, come on now. God, God doesn't need listening devices. He's your creator. He says, my sheep, hear my voice. And when I call, they come. They come. So here's the deal. If you ask God, Lord, make me sensitive to your voice. Yes, Lord, please. Trouble is no longer your issue. No weapon formed against you can prosper because you Thank know you. the voice. And when he yes. calls, you will please, come. Jesus. It doesn't matter if you died already. It doesn't matter if you were cremated. It doesn't matter if they scattered your ashes over the ocean. It doesn't matter if it was a car accident or cancer or COVID, whatever it is, it doesn't matter how long it was ago that you died. His sheep know his voice. And when he calls you a miracle, mm -hmm. Ezekiel will have to give the Lord a high five. It's when he says, can these bones live? Only you know, Lord, yes, they can live. Because when Jesus' voice calls you, wherever you are, you're going to get up and meet your Savior in peace. I got to let y'all go now. It's 830. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time that we've had tonight. We're studying some difficult things. And Lord, we have to remember that you haven't given us the spirit of fear, but you've given us a sound mind. You've given us the ability to have peace in the midst of the storm because you are so God. You are Thank our you. Savior, and tonight, Lord, we're grateful that you are our deliverer. I'm grateful to you. that though we're separated by space, that we're not separated from you. Wherever yeah. we are, you know your children, and you care about us. You have not left you. us. You are holding back the devil from all that he wants to do. So even at this moment, we can make it right with you. We thank Amen. you grace and that mercy now lord we extend this prayer to our children to our grandchildren yes. to our loved ones who have no yes. idea how close we are to you coming lord do yes, so. for them tonight don't let them yes. have any comfort until they are right with you teach them how Please. to our prayer asking for forgiveness lord heal yes, so. going on with them all of them as somebody, Sister Whitlock said earlier, you have plenty of room. You don't want anybody to be lost. So Lord, yes, Lord. we're grateful that you're saving us, but save our family as well is our prayer Thank in you. Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. All Amen. Right. Thank, you. Thank you everyone Amen. for hanging in there with us. We look forward to seeing you on next Wednesday night for prayer meeting. Look forward to seeing you also Friday night for Sabbath school. Uh, for former pastor, Dr. Donald Burton will be here. We're going to have a good time with that. And also with our worship services and everything else that's going on. God bless y'all. Have a wonderful